Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, the program dedicated to sharing timely information about the community hospital that's been taking care of Washington Township Healthcare District residents since it opened in 1958. Washington Hospital Today is provided for the sole purpose of informing residents about healthcare topics and issues that have been covered during community forums, free health and wellness classes, or as part of educational sessions held during the district's open board meetings. This program is one more way that Washington Hospital helps empower you, the residents of the district, by providing information needed to make informed decisions about your health. Today's presenter is Dr. Tam Nguyen. Dr. Nguyen is board certified by the American Board of Family Medicine and has been treating patients of all ages since 2008. Beginning on the East Coast, Dr. Nguyen earned his BA at John Hopkins University in Maryland, followed by his medical degree at Pennsylvania State University College of Medicine. He completed his family practice residency at San Jose O'Connor Hospital in California. Dr. Nguyen served at San Joaquin General Hospital as part of their medical staff and clinical faculty and as the Family Medicine Chair. In addition to family medicine, Dr. Nguyen is also board certified in aesthetic medicine. Dr. Nguyen practices medicine at Washington Township Medical Foundation. So we're going to talk about weight management. So the first thing we're going to do is uh, we're going to try to define what obesity is. And there's different definitions, and so we'll touch upon that and what's, of course, what's most commonly used. Describe the health consequences of obesity. And maybe I think the more important reason why everyone's here is to try to reduce some of the weight and different ways to help promote health while doing so. So first, what's the definition of obesity or being overweight? The short answer is excessive weight that impair your health. That's pretty easy, right? So sometimes it can be very subjective. And so is there a more objective way that we can define it? There's different ways. There's biometrics, you know, the old ways of, of measuring your arm, the, how much fat in your, under your arm and your tummy. Well, that's very subjective on, on the person who does it. So it's not as, as uh, more uh, standardized. So there's different now, another way is called the ideal body weight. That was first introduced by the insurance company, actually, to see if someone's overweight. But we don't use ideal body weight as much because it's almost, I always joke, it's ridiculous. No one's ever get to the ideal weight. By that definition, I'm overweight and obese as well. And so more precise definition, and I think more people have known about the body mass index, or BMI. And we'll touch upon that since that's more accepted here in the US. But around the world, they actually use the waist and hip measurements. So one of the benefits of the BMIs is pretty simple. But it only works for on certain ethnicity more of the Caucasians and the Hispanics and some uh, in the Western Hemisphere, not so much in other parts of the country like in Asia. With other parts of the country, the waist and hip is more accurate. And so a lot of times, even now today with the BMI, we're actually redefining what the BMI should be at the body mass index for different ethnicity. Then there's also the more technical ways called the abdominal fat or adipose tissue but that requires either a CAT scan or a DEXA scan to determine how much fat is in the stomach area. So that's a very indicative of you know, mortality, mobility, or, or different health problem. As I mentioned today, we'll mostly focus on the BMI, or the body mass index, because that's what used a lot here in the US, and we, we hear that a lot, so we'll focus on that. So body mass index is a measure of adult's weight in relation to his or her height. Using the weight in kilograms, so it has divided by the square of the height in, in meters. That sounds a lot, doesn't it? So the short answer is if you have a smartphone or you have a computer, plug it in and it, it can figure it out. Or if you go to your doctor's office, they, we always figure out the BMI for you. Because, and of course, we don't do this equation, so we just plug it into the computer and, and the computer will figure it out for us. And it spits out a number such as this, anywhere from 16 or 18 to up. So underweight is defined as anything with a BMI, or body mass index, of less than 18.5. Normal weight is between 18.5 to 24.9. Overweight is 25 to 30, a little bit less, and there's three classes of obesity, one, two, and three. 
30 to 35 and 35 to 40 and above 40 is class 3, the very morbidly obese. But the classification is important for many reasons, both implicated in health consequences, but also by insurance, what is uh, paid for and what is not. For example, if you need gastric bypass or surgery for obesity, then depending on the insurance, a lot of times they want it to be a class 2 or, or above. So that's why we, we have this. Now, since we're talking about it, even though everyone says, well, underweight is better, right? Not necessarily. It's what's considered a J-curve. Anything that's below 18 or 19, can, even though it's called underweight or low weight, you know, very skinny, that still is not healthy. So the ideal weight is to be normal between 18 to 25 or so, maybe a little bit 26. So therefore, you, know, you don't want to be too skinny, but you don't want to be overweight. There's health consequences for both. Being a normal weight is, is the best way or is the best place to go. Now, the BMI is really is only for adults, not for kids. Kids, they go by a different curve. They go what's, you know, there's a growth curve because it has to go by percentile. And the definition for kids is actually less concrete or less agreed upon. There's no universal definition for kid, but it's kind of accepted. It's called percentile. So anything above 95 to 99 percentile is considered overweight and obese. 95 for overweight and 99 percent for obese. For kids, starts uh, yes at any age, but generally we don't really start focusing on that until probably age two or, or and above. So with kids, there's much less universal acceptance. You know, the American Academy of Pediatrics doesn't have a concrete way. There's you know, the World Health Organization (WHO) doesn't have that. The CDC, but there's a general consensus. It's uh, it's 95 to 99 percent of generally after age two. So let's talk about weight trend. Why is this important? I always like this, you know, some people feel the weight's on their sh shoulder and others elsewhere, right? That's what we talk about generally around the stomach. So he, this is a survey that's generated by the CDC on the weight through uh, the country for the past 20, 30 years. If we look at this, in 1990, overweight obesity is, you know, between 10, 15 percent of the population. Ten years later, it's gone between 10 now to 20 percent. In 2009, it's now between 20 and 25 percent. If we focus on California, California here, back in 1990, less people are considered obese, less than 10 percent. Ten years later, roughly, it's now between around 15 percent, 15 to 19. In 2000, it is 20 to 25 percent. Let's look at the most recent census in 2014 or so. It's now between 25 percent and plus that are, are considered obese. That's just the definition of obesity. Now, if you factor in overweight and or higher, so anyone's overweight and obese, it's between 60 and 80 percent of people are considered overweight or obese. Okay, so we're you, we're all in good company. So that's why we, we give this talk, and it's a, it's a multi-billion-dollar industry. And so, of course, we can keep going on and on. I'm just going to focus on on only a certain aspect of that. So that's the trend for adults. We see the same trend in kids. Back in 1963, less than 4% of kids are considered obese. Now, closer to 2007-2008, it's 20 to 25%. And actually, the most recent census is actually one in four kids. And we'll go into some of the reasons why. But there, for example, cavities for, for kids with their teeth. One of the risk factors for kids getting cavities is their parents having cavities. Don't know the exact correlation, but they, they find that to be the case. So the, the general belief is that if the parents are not taking care of themselves, then they're not most likely the, they're modeling bad or good behavior to their kids. You know, it, even though sometimes we practice do what I say, not what I do, it's much stronger to do what I do. You know, so so that's the, the trend in kids and adults in the past 20 to 30 years. Let's see why this is the case. Is it a towel? or something else. So I think one of the biggest things is dietary shifts in, in America over the past 20 to 30 years. Have you noticed that food that are less healthy for you is actually cheaper than healthy food? Back then, fish was considered not hip, and so fish was very cheap compared to meat. Now to get good, healthy fish, salmon, tilapia, is much more expensive than getting a pizza. Why is it a two liter Coke? at 79 cents, sometimes even cheaper, versus organic milk, or even regular milk that is four to eight dollars a gallon. You know, and so 
that's one of the trends is that the processed food is, is much cheaper than the healthy food. And sometimes you can't blame a mother or a father, parents who need to feed their kids. And it's easier to go to McDonald's for $5 meal than to try to prepare a healthy meal going to the farmer's market. It used to be farmer's market was cheaper. Now it's more expensive because it's just trend to go. To, it sounds cool to go to the farmer's market. Besides the cheaper food, have you noticed that the portion size are bigger? And so generally we love to go to certain places that has large portion. I love to go to the Cheesecake Factory because the food, I think it's good, but also the portion is, is quite generous. You know, so, and, the, and of course, that comes with its calorie. And how often do we love buffets, right? It's like all you can eat. So kind of keep that in mind. You know, of course, you always want to double size that king, you know, increase the size, the Big Mac, and you know, you know, double size the, you know, all of our portions. And with the processed food comes a lot of sodium and a lot of retention of water and the, all the concerts that come with that. And even the schools, the school, you know, they have vending machines. And how many times have you heard in both in, in political politicians and all this stuff trying to get our school to be healthier and no, and I mean, part of you don't blame them because they, they get some revenue out of those, those vending machines, the Coke and the cookies and all this kind of stuff. So here's another reason why in the 1960, we used to walk a lot everywhere we go. 40% of the time or more, we would walk, walk to the market, walk to work, walk here, walk there. And this only goes up to 2001, but I'm willing to bet now that we walk even less, less than 10% of the time. Heck, you go across the street to get something, but I probably drive there because I don't want to walk. And so because of that, it's less activities. Our use of bikes and public transportation has also decreased. These are more activity stuff. Using, even using the bus, you have to walk to the bus stop. So that has gone down. So in its place, what are we doing? We're driving more. And there's a trend. We're driving a lot more now. Over 60% of the time we're driving. Back in 2001, you know, I don't have the most recent data, but I'm, sure, I'm willing to bet that the driving now in 2016 is probably closer to 80 to 90% of the time. So less activities, more calories. Television. I love to watch the television, but that's one of the biggest culprit for the, our kids as well as our adults. 70% of kids between 8, 3rd grade on, they have a television in their room. And 30% to now 50%, half of the kid, under 3, they barely speak 3-word three, three sentences and they watch they have a television in their room. So why is this important, having television? If you look at this graph, you can see the correlation both in the 1960 as well as the 1990. The more hours a person, whether it's a kid or adult, watches television, the more likely they're obese. The other thing that is important is that there's a lot of advertising for food and processed food, not you know the healthy food through the, te the TV. But I think the most important thing to note is that I always tell my patients who are kids, turn off the television for the kids and the adult. They'll do something else. Even taking a nap burns more calories than watching television. Burning, so depending on your weight, if you were to nap, it's from 0 0.2 calories per, per pound for one hour. So a typical adult who now weighs 150 pounds, let's say, so they would burn around 60 <coughs> to 80 calories watching, going, going to bed. Television is only 33, watching television at that same hour. Reading a book burns more calorie than watching television. So turn off the tube. Now we can stop calling television, we call it screen time. So no screen time. Yes, the iPad, the finger, there's more calories. <laughs> there's more calories. But it's not as much as walking. It's not as much as reading a book because they process a lot more. There's more and more activities. So, so the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends less than two hours per day. That's, I still think that's a lot. I say, I personally think one hour. But two hours a day. And you think, well, that seems a lot. But one movie is an, it's roughly two hours. And how often do we have our, the television as, as our babysitter? I'm guilty of that. I try not to. I know the data and I know the statistics. But sometimes, gosh darn it, I just want that, that two hours to myself. Pop the three kids down. Here's uh, whatever, <laughs> Disney or something. And so I can just do my thing. And they're captivated. And so so I, let's talk why obesity is important. No big deal, because back in the 1800s, beauty was defined as little plump. But today we want that, you know, size zero and double zero, which I make, makes no sense to me how a dress size could be double zero or negative. 
negative means they disappear out of existence, right? But okay, some of this people already know. Excessive weight is associated with diabetes, and diabetes you've heard of all the bad things that goes with diabetes: foot problem, kidney, eyes, and all that. Coronary artery disease, basically heart attacks. Peripheral artery disease, basically cramps in the legs <coughs> and poor circulation, stroke, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and arthritis. Every pound that you are overweight puts seven pounds on the knee. So it's like, oh, okay, so what, right? But let's say you're 10 pounds <coughs> overweight, just 10 pounds. Many of us, I'm willing to bet, are 10 pounds overweight. That's 70 pounds that we're putting extra pressure on the knee. So 100 pounds, that's almost the size of, a, of like a car that's putting pressure. So the more pressure that you're on the joint, the more likely to get arthritis, okay? Because it's grinding away. Sleep apnea, the snoring, can cause breathing problem, period problem, gallbladder, pregnancy complications. And of course, there's a lot of social stigma. It increases certain kinds of cancer. And of course, it increases all causes of mortality issues. The big area that you want to focus on is cardiovascular, the heart problems, the diabetes, because diabetes would then creates other problems, other joint pains. And then there are some uh, studies that show it linked to a certain cancer, endometrial, cervical, and colon. And infertility, sometimes it's more difficult to, uh, to have kids if, if you're overweight, both the male and the female. And premature death and disabilities in general with, with being overweight. Okay, now that I scared everyone, let's, <laughs> let's say, can you lose the weight if you wanted to? Yeah, the answer is yes, we can do it. We can lose the weight. Now, how much is a different question. Then a bigger question is, can you keep the weight off? That's the hard problem. You can be on any program and you've seen commercial after commercial, Jenny Craig, Weight Watchers, Atkins, Ornish, you get all these phase through and there's the, there was a shake diet. There's so many, you, you, you will lose them, but you will bounce right back. So let's talk about that a little bit. So here's a rebound gate, uh, weight graph. Here's the, the weight program phase in gray right there. Plug that in, whatever you want to do, whatever your sisters say try this, your doctor try this, and mom and dad to try this, you will lose the weight. All, and if they, didn't, if they do the study, you will lose the weight. Whether it's 5%, 10%, or 15%, within that six months to a year, you will start regaining the weight back if you're not careful. And the statistics is anywhere between 65 to 95 percent will regain the weight within six months to three years to three to four years. The longer you keep the weight off, the more likely. So why is that the case? All this that we talked about already. But our body loves to be what's called hemostasis, which means that we've been in overweight. The longer we're in overweight, the more our body likes to stay at that weight. So I, I keep the analogy of, of a rubber band. So the rubber band is here, and you lose the weight, you're doing well, and guess what happened when you stretch the rubber band? It will snap right back. The body wants to snap back to the same weight. And so the longer you're at, at, at the overweight, wherever you're at, the longer the body wants to stay there. So working with your doctor, in my opinion, or just if you keep the weight, the longer you keep it at a lower weight or higher weight, you shift the balance of, of the body wanting to be at a different weight, whether it's a healthy weight or not so healthy weight, okay? So just keep that in mind. So here's another graph that shows the weight gain. The faster you lose the weight, which is great. We're Americans. We want it fast. We want it easy. And we want it yesterday, you know, and, and at no cost to us. It's kind of like winning the lottery. So you can lose 100 pounds in a month. Besides health issue, which we have to talk about, the problem is the faster you lose the weight, the faster risk of bouncing right back. So here's, that's the first Dajakis line. Slow, steady weight makes that shift in your our body, our mind, that it wants to be at a lower weight. If you want to lose weight and keep it off, I would recommend within six months to a year. What, of course, depending on how much weight you want to lose. That period, which is down at the bottom, you're more likely to sustain that over four years. And once you pass the four or five years, you're more likely to stay at the new weight, good or bad. Okay? So, and just like anything else, just like tobacco, when you quit and you don't succeed, each time you fail, it gets that much harder to succeed the next time. So how many times have you feel, oh, I've tried so many diets, I don't want to do another diet. Okay, so that's why it's important to do a good steady weight loss. And what is that steady weight loss? One to two pounds a week. I know, it's not, it's not fun. You, you want one or two pounds a day, right? 
but one to two pound is safe, both medically and sustainable. sustainable. Okay, so let's talk about the weight balance. If we're all superstar, I mean, in terms of super athlete, then weight loss is pretty easy. I pay you $2 million to, to exercise. Go for it, do eight hours of exercise, and then all of us will lose the exact weight and look good, right? The next, or get paid to act, and so they act, they, Tom Cruise and all that. But we don't have that. We have life that we need to balance. And it's a simple equation. Though simple, it's very hard to apply. What goes in has to go come out, meaning the calories in, then the exercise. That's all it is. All these different weight programs, they basically follow the same principle. There's the 500 calories, the ornish, basically what's going in, converting to calories, and then you, you reduce your calories, of course, then you, then you walk more, you, so you balance, that's just that simple about equation. But though it's simple, it's really hard to apply, right? Or else it, there's a weight pro problem won't be a problem. So what we would want to touch upon is a lifestyle modification. So it's called modification and not a change, because change is hard. So we'll talk about a couple of mindful eating, ways to exercise without really exercising, healthy self-talk, you know, the self-positive talks, and then we'll talk about the, diff the different diets. Then lastly, we'll, we'll talk about medication. We're not gonna talk about surgery because that's a whole different talk by itself, you know, different types of, uh, of surgery for weight loss. Some are more successful than others. The more research on us, like for example, the gastric bypass versus the sleeve and the different ways of do that. So and there's, there's uh, definitely uh, studies on safety and efficacy and all that that comes with that. So we won't touch upon that. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to discuss that. Okay, so let's talk about some basic lifestyle that you can do to help with the weight. One's very simple, eat breakfast. How, how many times have your parents or you have told your kids breakfast is the most important part of the, of the day? And it really is, even if you're not hungry, because having a good breakfast, a healthy breakfast, will sustain you, the calories much more so than lunch or dinner. We're less likely to overeat in breakfast than we are with lunch and dinner. So having a healthy breakfast in the morning really helps. If you want to skip a meal, don't skip breakfast. Okay, lunch is the best time, and depending on culture, sometimes they skip dinner. Simple one, simply reducing calories by 500 to 1,000 a day, you will lose that one or two pounds per week that we talked about. So 500 calories can be simple. That could be uh, generally one piece of, uh, like a sandwich. Heck, a Big Mac, if you guys like Big Mac, is 2,000 calories right there, and so you can, you know, that alone, you can reduce that. So 500 calories a day can give you that or doing some simple, moderate exercise, reducing 150 calories a day. 150 calories is roughly one uh, slice of bread. So just reducing, so anything the size of your palm is roughly 150 calories or one serving. So cut whatever that is, except veggies. You can eat as much as veggies you want. The carb, the protein, everything else you need to, to, to reduce. So 100 calories a day with exercise, you will lose the weight. So just simple calorie modification. Diary, keeping a diary is actually really important. You don't know how many times my patients, my family says, I hardly eat anything and I'm still getting the weight. I hear that a lot. I'm sure you say that a lot. I'm sure you've heard that a lot. When you keep the diary, you'll be surprised how much stuff we put in our mouth without realizing it. That piece of chip, that piece of candy that you walk by, before you know those calories add up. And they're not, that's not even lunch, breakfast, or dinner. So keeping a diary, everything you put in your mouth will help. And the soda, we talked about soda being cheaper. There's a lot of empty calories, which means it's not healthy for you, but it has a lot of calories. So keeping a diary really helps. Eating slowly, why is that important? It takes our brain a little bit of time to tell our, our head that we're full. So by the time that happens, we're like, oh my gosh, I'm so full. And our stomach is elastic. The more you eat, the more it stretches, and the more food you will need. The less you eat, the more you, you are, you're more likely to get full. So eat slowly. So what, how can you eat slowly? Chew 20 times before you swallow. He's like, well, 20 times, do I do that? You'd be surprised. The average amount of time people chew is, anyone who want to venture to guess? Three. Exactly. Two to three times. Up, up, down. Okay? Chew 20 times. The food starts getting bland. Oh, my God. Have a conversation. That's unique, right? Having family discussion. Talk about the school. It does more than just the weight loss. And actually for kids, the one area besides television that we talked about to help kids lose weight is family dinner, eating together. Because you talk, you interact, and surprisingly, it's, it's not a direct correlation that they lose the weight, but I think because of your, the interaction, the eating less, and, you know, and then there's good health and modeling and everything else. So 
eating slowly really does, does help sleep seven to eight hours. Uh, we talked about slower weight loss already, so the slower the better in terms of maintaining it, so not too rapid, any program. So let's talk about exercise. We know exercise is important, but a lot of times we don't get the time to do that. So if all things being equal, you should have moderate intensity. So what is moderate intensity? Moderate intensity means that your heartbeat should get uh, 50, around half of its maximum heart rate. What is the maximum heart rate? is basically let's you, you feel your pulse so where so wherever your, your your pulse is at you want to increase that by you know, almost by 50 percent or is 220 minus your age that's where you how high your heart should go up to and stay with you know still being safe so for example if a teenager at 20 year old just for my simple math they can their heart rate can go up to 200 so moderate intensity can be at, at 100 you have to balance it out a little bit. If you're 100 years of age, you know, do you really want to go up, you know, you know, your heartbeat to go up too high? So you have to talk with your doctor. But all things being equal, the maximum heart rate is determined by 220 minus your age. And you generally go half of that for moderate intensity. And it has to be 150 minutes a week. To stay healthy, that 150 minutes can be divided any way you want. 10 minutes each time, time 15 times throughout the seven days. But if you want to lose weight, it should be contiguous or continuous. So an hour is better than two thirty minutes, if it's possible. But you will still stay healthy if you do the 150 minutes cumulative. So if you can go to for more intense, then you can go down to 65 minutes. You know, what's, what's intense? Getting your heartbeat up there at 80% of maximum heart rate. So, but all that is difficult sometimes. I mean, you have to go to the gym or it's, it's a time to go for a walk or run. A simple way to incorporate your life is I would recommend getting a pedometer. A pedometer can be something cheap, like the one in red. It's $3, $5. You put it on your hip. It's like a pager. It tells you how many steps you take. You can get something fancy as a Fitbit that's $200 or so, you know, the different models. And it tells you exactly what to, what to do. But basically, how many steps you should take throughout the day. The goal is 10,000 steps a day. That's not easy to think about that, unless your job is really require walking. For the most part, American walks around two to 3,000 a day. If you can you know, increase it by five times or four times, then you, it will help, but that's not easy. So that's why, instead of spending 15 minutes circling the parking lot to find the closest park, park the furthest away and walk into the, into the, the grocery or whatever you need to park at. Instead of taking the elevator, take the stairs, so there's different things you can do. For lunch, go for a walk. So different little things like that can help. And of course, walk with the kids. Good role modeling, good bonding time. You know, let's say whether they're 18 or whether they're eight years old, walk with them. You know, let's go a family walk or something like that. And let's talk about the diet. You guys have heard this. I'll go through it. It, it all works. There's the Atkin, the Paleo, the South Beach. That's the, what's called the low carb diet. Then there's, there's, there's the moderate carb, which is the addict diet. Then there's the low fat diet, the American Heart Association, the Dash, the, the Learn, the Ornish. Then there's the Mediterranean, which is the olive oil and the rich fish oil, and that's the Weight Watchers. There's so many diets. Do they work? The answer is yes, they work. Pick one. When it comes down to it, what diet should you follow? Count the calories. Just count the calories. And we can work from that. So. When I, when I do weight program with my patients, I say, pick whatever you want. You love meat? Pick a meat diet, but just count the calories. If you like vegetables, great. If you like this, you know, just everything in moderation. Count the calories. But it's not easy to count calories and do all the stuff that we've been talking about. So I would recommend, how many phones, everyone has an iPhone, or not an iPhone, but a smartphone, right? Samsung, iPhone, nowadays. You know, you can't, they can't afford uh, to pay the utility bill, but they can get an iPhone, right? Yeah. So, so, so if you have that, one of these apps can help you monitor everything that we talked about. Lose it, weight loss, packed, Pokemon Go, because you, they, they keep it, but just make sure you don't get hit by a car. You hear many stories about that, right? My Fitness Pal, Diet Hero, Fujicade, Nike Plus, iPhone Health, Google Fit, Weight Watchers. They're all apps on both the, 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 the Android, which is the Google base, and then there's the, the iOS, the iPhone iOS program. So they're, all, they're both on there. I haven't played all of them. I play with MyFitnessPal. I have no financial stakes. So I just happen to know MyFitnessPal. It's one of the better ones. It, 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 it takes a little bit of time when you to, to do it initially. After that, it's really simple. A few touches, and then it will monitor the calories. It will monitor your steps. 
but the, the problem using the iPhone for your steps is it got to be on your body, right? Mm -hmm. Many of the ladies have it in, the, in their purse, and the purse is down here. Mm -hmm. And so I personally like to just get a pedometer. But it can, if you have the Fitbit, it can sync with the phone, and so you know, they can talk to each other. It will tell you how many hours you sleep by, by how you roll around. So it can do a lot. And so get these apps to help you. It will keep your diary, everything that we have talked about. One of the apps can help you do that. Okay? So, and many of them, they have a free version. And of course, they also have a paid version, but, but just the free version is adequate. Okay, so now that we went through the standard stuff, let's talk about medications to help you with the, with the weight loss. Okay, I'm going to, like one doctor said, I'm going to prescribe you a diet pill. Can you supersize it, please? Okay, so the optimal weight program, any of these modules by itself can help. We talked about the different diet. We talk about lifestyle modification. We talk about exercise. So without the meds, you can do it. But if you can combine all three, all four modules, it's a better fit. It will help you better to lose the weight and sustain the weight and maintain the weight. Okay? So I'm just going to quickly go through this. These are just names, but there's a lot out there. And what you could do is work with your doctor. When my patient comes to see me, I say, okay, let's find something that fit with you, and we can use that to, to model a program for you. There's a fat inhibition medication like Xenical and Ali or Ali, and that's basically, you know, you can't absorb the fat and you just poop it all out. And then there's appetite suppressant, phentermine, and there's pendidamethazine, and there's a lot of medication that's there, out there. There's a lot of diabetic medication that does not affect the sugar directly. So you can use these medication for non-diabetic and you won't be hypoglycemic or low sugar. And so, for example, if I have a patient who's diabetic, I would choose a diabetic medication that will help with the, the, the diabetes, but also the weight gain. If they have some neuropsychiatric -psych condition, depression, anxiety, I would use something that will also help with the weight loss. So we cater that. So it's not, it's not just simply, or simply suppressant. So there's different medication, like all these neuropsychiatric medication, the SSRI, the Prozac, the, the Zoloft, there's different ones but only certain one, not everyone's. Others will actually increase your weight. So you have to make sure that, that you work with one that doesn't. And if, what's nice about that is that your insurance will pay for it. When you use something that matches your condition, then your insurance will pay for it. There's other stuff that's out there, Saxenda, now Traxone, Locarsin. So there's different ones, and of course combination, anything we can combine to help get more effectiveness uh, throughout. Okay, then there's a lot of dietary supplement. I can't speak much of, about this because there's no real good data, but I'm sure some of this work if you want to try it. So once again, the optimal weight is a combination of, of each one of this. Each one itself can do it, but a combination together is more successful. And like I said, when we try to put you on a program, at least through the, with your physician, it should be so that you're less likely to rebound, but also to be most likely to be successful so that you don't have this constant yo-yo, which makes it harder and harder each time. So that's a quick summary of weight, its cause, problems, and a way to help you lose that.